Friends, this video ended up being pretty long with all the questions that I had to get through. So I've decided to split it into two parts. So if you're seeing part one today, you can look out for part two to be released soon, but I'll have them in a playlist together. Okay, let's go on with the questions. Hi, Weaving friends. This is the Q&A video that I was supposed to do months ago, but never got around to. However, I have this whole list of questions sitting here just waiting for me. So let's dive right in. First of all, Louisa asks, I have a 16 inch rigid heddle loom. Can I make warping adjustments to fit an 18 inch pattern on it? There are many, many patterns that are adjustable to be able to weave them in a shorter width. Obviously, if you have an 18 inch width pattern, you're never going to be able to achieve that 18 inch width on say a 16 inch or a 10 inch loom. It's just not physically possible. However, you can absolutely adapt the pattern to suit the width of your own loom. The thing that you have to consider is the actual project. What, what is the project? If it's something like a wide scarf and you're making it into a narrower scarf, then that's not really an issue at all to adjust the width of the pattern because it's not going to affect the overall piece. However, if you have something like, let's say you have quite a wide blanket, maybe it's like a 30 inch blanket and you're wondering if you can narrow that down to your 16 inch loom. Well, yes, you still can, but do you want a blanket that is 16 inches in width? It'll be less than 16 inches once you allow for shrinkage, etc. But then you could maybe think about doing something like weaving two panels and sewing the panels together or three panels or however wide you would need it. One other consideration when you're adjusting a pattern is you have to take the design into consideration. So for example, let's say we had um, like an overshot Star of Bethlehem kind of design. I'll try and put an image on the screen here so that you know what I'm talking about. So let's say that with the original pattern, it had been arranged so that you have your stars all across and they're all lined up and sort of symmetrical with the edges of the cloth or so that you have like whole repeats of the design within the cloth or maybe you've got half repeat on one side and half repeat on the other. If you're talking about adjusting that kind of design, then you have to think about whether it's going to balance properly visually and whether that's going to be an issue for you. Maybe you don't mind if some of the design is taken out so you don't have a whole repeat or a half repeat, whatever it was at one edge. But that's just something else to consider when you're adjusting a pattern is are you going to get whole repeats of the pattern? What's that going to look like? Is that going to bother you? The second question from Louisa is, can I mix different fibers for warp and weft? For example, can I use an 8.4 cotton warp with a wool weft in sport size? And will the size differences be a problem? Well, the simple answer to that is, you can use whatever yarns you want. You can do whatever you want in your weaving. But of course, you're going to get different results if you're mixing your yarns up using different fiber types, different sizes. So um, the things to look out for with doing this, let's say you were using, I don't know, an 8-2 cotton for your warp and then um, a sports weight for your weft of cotton. Let's, let's just say that we're using all cotton in this hypothetical project. What you're going to get if you use a much heavier weight of yarn in the weft is you're going to get weft dominance. So the weft is going to stand out more, more of the warp is going to be covered. That can be a desirable effect. If you think about something like overshot or crackle weave or um, summer and winter, a bunch of, bunch of different weave structures, you do actually use a heavier weft for the pattern to make the pattern stand out and be a little bit bolder. So that can be a, a technique that you can use to get those kind of results that you're after. Um, now, if we're talking about different fiber types, for example, if we're talking about you taking a cellulose yarn, uh, which is a plant-based yarn, um, cotton, cotillon, hemp, tensile, etc. If you cross that then with a protein-based yarn, like wool, um, angora, alpaca, any of those animal fibers, 
then what's going to happen is usually when you get to the wet finishing stage or the washing at the end you will have different shrinkage rates it would be kind of unusual for a cotton to shrink at exactly the same rate as a wool now as to how much that shrinkage is the difference it really depends on the yarn sometimes it would might be negligible other times it might be really drastic again this can be used as a technique something like deflected double weave it's desirable to use fibers with different shrinkage rates because that gives the result at the end that is really unique to that weave structure. You can do it in other weave structures as well. I've seen some really interesting pieces where something like a wool is used on a cotton weft and the wool will shrink more than the cotton weft. I've seen some really interesting pieces where something like a cotton warp will be used and a wool in the weft and the wool has a much greater shrinkage rate than that particular cotton and then and then you get some like textural movement happening within the piece once it's dried. They're very interesting and great if that's what you are aiming for. But you have to know that mixing up the yarns like that, your results might be a little bit unpredictable. So I'm going to be a big bore and say, you need to sample. You need to sample with the yarns that you want to use for a particular project first. Otherwise, you could get some very unpredictable results. And sampling will show you exactly how those yarns are going to react when thrown together um, and with your particular weave structure because the different yarns, they're not necessarily going to behave the same for every single weave structure that you do. And so a sample in exactly what you want to do for the finished project would be highly recommended. The next question is from Tracy and it is, how do you organize and structure your day? Well, this is something that I'm not very good at. I'm not that much of a planner, though I do like to have plans in place. I find that I don't naturally tend to be that organized. What I find easiest to do is to follow the natural rhythm of the day and be open to change within that rhythm. So if I'm having a day at home, I don't have any outside appointments, I don't have to go shopping or do anything else outside the home or property, then I have a fairly regular routine that I follow. And that routine, of course, is quite changeable depending on what's happening that day. But I find that's the best way to do things for me. I think if I try and pre-plan too much, then I may stress myself a little bit in trying to stick to something that's a little bit rigid. So going with the flow works pretty well for me. I'll have a bunch of uh, projects, ideas, things I need to work on in my mind, and I might, I might even have a list written out and cross them off as I go. That does work well for me, but I don't do that all the time because again, I don't seem to do so well with that rigidity. So as far as a typical day, well, my day always starts with uh, a, a hot shower. That is like my luxury. <laughs> Ever since I had children, I found my biggest luxury um, when my children were really young and when they were babies was to have a hot shower in peace. And so now I get to do that every morning and no one's bothering me. And then that's followed by prayer. I always start the day with prayer, um, a light breakfast and coffee, always coffee in the morning. And then I start going through my emails. So my morning time is very much taken up by stuff just working at the laptop and trying to get on top of the emails that I receive every single day. I tend to kind of prioritize them so I don't necessarily work on all of them at once. If there are so many, I'm not going to sit there for hours. That's not very good for my physical or mental health. So I usually put in about an hour at that point in the morning doing emails. And then if there are some that are lower on the priority list, then I'll mark them as lower priority and I'll come back to them later in the day when I'm feeling a little bit fresher for it. Then the mornings up until about lunchtime, I usually try to focus on spending that time in the house. So I'm with my kids, we're working on stuff together. I'm available to them. I'm not too distracted by other stuff that's going on. And we also make sure that the house is in suitable order. Is that something that I personally really need is to have things uh, fairly clutter free, things clean, not building up um, and causing that tension in my mind. And then after we've all had lunch together, then I will usually come out to the studio. 
I will go back to emails and by then there are inevitably more emails to deal with and so I'll do that and I'll usually try and get on top of all emails for the day at that point and then I'll start working on whatever project I have going on at that time whether it's um, a class for the weaving school whether it's a new pattern that's what I'm doing right now I'm working on a new pattern for my Etsy shop I'm also working on a personal project which is just behind me um, sometimes I will be writing magazine articles sometimes I'll be preparing for a workshop that I've got coming up sometimes I'll be preparing for a future project that I want to do doing research and just anything like that and so I'll often spend a good chunk of the afternoon in the studio um, at different times during the afternoon I might go into the house and read to one of my girls or do some other small task in there if someone needs me um, thankfully my husband usually cooks dinner in the evenings he's very good at doing that and so we get to enjoy that and then there's all the cleanup from that oh and of course um, most days there's some sort of exercise worked in usually for me that is a walk because I really love walking out in the fresh air it clears my head it makes me feel good so I'll often do that and then and I'm also trying to incorporate some simple workouts into my exercise routine and so I'll do those workouts out here in the studio usually with a YouTube video um, sometimes like a Pilates workout sometimes it's a walking workout but I always do gentle workouts I don't do high intensity or anything like that my focus is more on gaining strength and increasing my bodily health which increases my mental health then at the end of the day we all pray together as a family we often watch a movie together a lot of the time I'll work on a creative project while we're watching a movie like a crochet blanket that I'm working on at the moment some sort of lap project I will do because I find it difficult to just sit still and watch a movie I need to be doing something with my hands it's much more fulfilling for me or if we're not watching a movie then if the weather's good we will go down to the beach we're very blessed to live very close to the beach and so we'll walk on the beach or whatever but basically doing something together as a family at night time now that routine that I just talked about is quite different to what I was doing previously um, last year especially I just did I I just worked way too hard I burnt myself out I had some really hard and difficult times and difficult lessons which I'm now really grateful for because God taught me so much through showing me that I was really going about things the wrong way so now I have a much better balance it's taken me months to kind of recover and put together a new routine or ease into that's really what I did is ease into a new routine making sure that I was doing things like just the basic things like getting back to making bread that's another part of my routine that happens very very frequently today I'm making sourdough bread and just all sorts of other you know important slow family routines the next question comes from Marsha she says I'm a knitter who was inspired by your videos to purchase a rigid heddle and I fell in love I however do not understand yarn sizes versus reed used for that size what size reed for 84 and so on yes this is a very common beginner question how on earth do I get my head around all of these yarn sizes and all of these reed sizes and what yarn I use for different projects so because of people like you Marsha I've put together so many resources on this very topic I have videos here on YouTube about best yarns to use for best projects yarn sizes yarn types same as on my blog I've got a bunch of articles that address this issue but the main thing that I have put together that I think is really specific and helpful to people like who are asking this kind of question is the weavers toolkit this is a downloadable PDF and it's basically a guide and a small ebook but a guide for newer weavers and more seasoned weavers who perhaps just don't you know that and they're not making the connections with the yarns and with all the information like there's so much information some of it's conflicting some of it's confusing 
And so the Weaver's Toolkit just kind of lays it all out for you. Here you go. Here are some charts to, to show you what reads, what read or heddle size you should be using for this specific yarn. And then for this specific yarn, what sort of projects you might weave with those yarns at those sizes. And the toolkit has a heap of other really useful information as well. So I'm going to leave a link to that down below for anyone who is seeking that kind of information. I'm sure you'll find it very helpful.